On this lesson, we'll show how to use decision cost and prior probabilities to derive the minimum risk test for binary hypothesis testing, and we'll illustrate the method with an example. Well, let's start with our standard scenario for a binary hypothesis test where we have probability density or mass functions for each hypothesis, and we design a decision rule to classify the data into each hypothesis so that we will have one of four situations. A detection, where we choose H1 and H1 is true. A false alarm, where we choose H1 and H0 is true. A miss, where we choose H0 when H1 is true and a situation where we choose H0 and H0 is true. Now let's suppose we can assign some costs to each of these situations. C11 would be the cost of a detection. C10 would be the cost of a false alarm, for example. The costs C11 and C00 correspond to situations where we make the correct decisions, and the costs C01 and C10 correspond to situations when we make the wrong decisions. Now we'll assume that the cost of making an incorrect decision when H0 is true is greater than the cost of making a correct decision when H0 is true. Likewise, the cost for making an incorrect decision when H1 is true is greater than the cost of making a correct decision when H1 is true. Now these assumptions are reasonable for any situation in which the costs reflect the performance of our decision rule. Furthermore, let's assume that we have some prior knowledge about the probability that each of the hypotheses are true before we observe the data. P0 might be the prior probability that H0 is true, and P1 might be the prior probability that H1 is true. And of course, the sum of these probabilities must be equal to 1, so we really only need to specify one of them in any situation. Now we could compute the average cost, which we often call the risk for our decision rule. And because we associate higher costs with errors, we'd like to design a decision rule that has a low value for this risk. In fact, if possible, we'd like to design a decision rule that has the lowest possible risk compared to all other decision rules. Now to do that, we'll rewrite the risk in terms of the prior probabilities and the conditional probabilities that we previously related to detections and false alarms. Now when H0 is true and we choose H0, then the conditional probability is 1 minus the false alarm probability, and the prior is P0. When H0 is true and we choose H1, then the conditional probability is the false alarm probability, and the prior is P0. When H1 is true and we choose H0, then the conditional probability is 1 minus the detection probability and the prior is P1. And finally, when H1 is true and we choose H1, then the conditional probability is the detection probability and the prior is P1. Then the sum of all of these terms will be the risk and that's the thing we want to minimize. Now, if we rearrange the terms, we'll get a couple of terms that depend only on the costs and the prior probabilities, and we'll get a couple of terms that depend on the false alarm and the detection probabilities. Now, because the false alarm probability is the probability that we select hypothesis 1 when hypothesis 0 is true, this is the integral of the density for hypothesis 0 over the classification region x1. And because the detection probability is the probability we select hypothesis 1 when hypothesis 1 is true, then this is the integral of the density for hypothesis 1 over the classification region for x1. Accordingly, we can rewrite those terms in terms of an integral over the classification region for hypothesis 1. Now because there's a negative sign in front of this integral, and because we want to minimize the risk, we'd like the region to include only positive terms for the integrand. That is, for any values of x that make the terms inside the integral positive, they should be part of the region we classify h1, and anything that's negative should be part of the other region for classifying as hypothesis 0.
Well, for any costs and prior probabilities, we can rewrite this inequality in the way we've shown it here. And because we've assumed that the error costs are larger than the costs of being correct, those terms involving the costs will be positive, and we can rewrite the inequality in this way. Therefore, the classification regions are determined by comparing the ratio of the two densities to a threshold that's determined by the costs and the prior probabilities. This test, then, is called the likelihood ratio test, and it's the way to classify so that we attain minimum risk for a specified set of costs and prior probabilities. Now, for ease of implementing the decision algorithm and for subsequent analysis of the algorithm, we'll often want to simplify the form of the decision rule as much as possible, and in many situations, this will be easier if we apply the logarithm to both sides of the inequality. Well, let's look at an example for which the difference in the cost when h0 is true is equal to 20, and the difference in the cost when h1 is true is equal to 8. Furthermore, let's assume that the prior probability that h0 is true is 0.4, so that, of course, the prior probability for h1, or hypothesis 1, is 0.6. This means that the likelihood ratio test threshold will be 8 divided by 4.8, or approximately 1.6667, or 5 thirds. Next, let's suppose that under hypothesis 0, the density for the observation is an exponential with a mean equal to 10. And under hypothesis 1, the density for the observation is an exponential with a mean equal to 4. This means that the likelihood ratio is 10 fourths times e to the negative x times 1 fourth minus 1 tenth. And we could use this as our test, but the nonlinearity of computing the exponential can be avoided by applying the logarithm of both sides to this test. In this case, the logarithm of a likelihood ratio is the logarithm of 10 fourths minus x times 1 fourth minus 1 tenth. And we can group those terms as 6 over 40. And this then should be compared to the logarithm of the threshold we computed from the costs and prior probabilities. Now we won't change this inequality if we subtract the logarithm of 10 fourths from both sides. And that leaves us with a test that multiplies the observation by negative 6 over 40 before comparing to the threshold. Now, because it might be cleaner to specify the test as a simple comparison with the observation, we could multiply both sides by negative 40 over 6. But because we're multiplying by a negative number, we'd need to reverse the inequality. Well, the resulting test, then, simply compares the observation to a threshold that's determined by the means for the two probability densities, the costs, and the prior probabilities. Now, when we put those particular values in, this corresponds to partitioning the observation space into the region above and below approximately 2.7031. Observations below are classified as hypothesis 1. Observations above classified as hypothesis 0. Now, graphically, we can see that these two regions relative to the observation densities for the two hypotheses. Changes in the costs and priors will shift the threshold left or right, but because the observed data will never be negative, we've truncated the threshold to zero if any costs or priors caused it to compute to a negative value. Now, the steps for developing Bayes' test are always the same as the ones we've outlined here, but in some situations we'll find that the mathematics will lead us to more complicated partitions of the observation space, and we'll actually investigate one of those in a subsequent lesson.